OK, so my name's Aaron Jones. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know me. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I will give you my introduction. So I work for a local police department uh, where I write software. And I have written software for many years. Uh, previous to that, I worked for the Texas State Guard, where I was on Operation Border Star. And I worked on projects like uh, license plate readers and intelligence analysis out there on the border. And uh, I worked all the way from El Paso Texas, uh, down the Rio, all the way down to the Gulf, and then back. Uh, worked on a lot of projects out there and was involved in everything, essentially, uh, while I was down there. And uh, so human trafficking, game cameras, uh, drug interdiction, all of that stuff. And during that period of time, I got really interested in uh, software development and I was like oh that's the that's kind of the wave of the future I'm seeing these guys run these license plate readers and we're starting to use machine learning and this was many many years ago uh, machine learning used to watch the cameras right so guys would walk past the camera they'd be carrying a gun the thing would pop up and it would say firearm or it would say you know p potential narcotics all kinds of stuff and so I was like oh that is the wave of the future I'm gonna get on that because I think there's gonna be money in that and there was um, so Got done with that, came out here, started working for law enforcement out here after working for an insurance company. So I tried to be a normie, uh, tried to go into an insurance company job. I was like, I'm gonna write software for insurance companies. I'm gonna do all this stuff and then that will be fine. Uh, that turned out I couldn't do it. I did it for maybe two years and then I completely gave up on it. And I even went to my boss, I was like, man, I'm gonna be out of here in a few months. I'm already looking at other law enforcement related stuff. I can't do this. And he was like, awesome, thanks for warning me. So came out here. Uh, I am a TLO, which is a terrorism liaison officer. Uh, went to training for that, became a TLO. Uh, I am a, what is called an AZ post, so Arizona Police Officer Standards and Training uh, General Instructor. So everything that I teach, it usually meets quality for uh, continuing education credits. And if you're in law enforcement, you can take my classes and then you can go out and you can get a little piece of paper and I can sign it and then you get credit uh, for going to my classes. That's really what that means. But in addition to that, <coughs> excuse me, if you notice, I'm wearing a shirt that says UAT. Uh, I'm also the program champion for cybersecurity at the University of Advancing Technology. So not only do I work full-time in law enforcement, I also work full-time in education. Uh, and some of my students are here and former students and folks that I know. So uh, that is fantastic to me. In addition to all of this, uh, I run a web page, which is retro64.xyz. You can come here. I have videos for all of my talks. So if you miss anything that I'm discussing today, you can always come back. You can watch this stuff again later. In addition to that, I run a YouTube channel uh, where I teach classes on things like FreeBSD, Linux, cybersecurity. Uh, I teach all kinds of super neat things. Um, so some of the nice comments that I have gotten uh, include, <laughs> that's funny that you laugh. <laughs> yeah, so some of the nice comments that I've gotten. Uh, well, actually, I'm gonna, uh, we'll start off with a nice one, like a real nice one. I took my resume, so I'm combat lifesaver, uh, former, did EMT basic training, went through just a ton of stuff. I do a lot of executive protection training. I send my students to EP courses, intelligence analysis, uh, you know, firearms training, all kinds of stuff, which I know it sounds crazy, right? But uh, when we talk about like cybersecurity, it goes farther and deeper than just like, we need the people who can work on logs, but then we also need people who can go out and they can deal with these guys who are gonna go into like a hostile environment. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with like South Africa, things like that. So with that said, nicest comment I ever got. I took my resume in, handed it off to uh, a, a young lady who works for Canonical, said, hey, can you check out my resume? And she came back and she handed it to me and her eyes were real wide. And she says, wow, you're a real life shadow runner. Never felt better in my entire life. That was the best compliment I'd ever gotten. Uh, and then of course, I've had people who made fake accounts on LinkedIn just to let me know that they think I'm a psychopath and that they hate me and uh, that I'm dangerous and all this other stuff. So, uh, with that said, let's get into Shodan. We're going to look for some critical infrastructure and see if we can find things that are putting the United States in danger, right? So performance objectives. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, so if I start to go over, just stop me. OK. Uh, we're going to identify what Shodan is. We're going to explain how to search with Shodan. 
We're going to explain how to build an alternative to Shodan for those of you who are interested. And we're going to talk about why as well. Uh, if you decide that you want to connect with me, you can do so on LinkedIn. You'll see I'm connected with the guy who actually runs Shodan. So I've had an opportunity to talk to this guy. And if you become a UAT student, you can just put in your .edu email and you'll automatically get an upgraded account here. Just saying. Uh, and then explain where Shodan is often used in the hacking timeline. So bear with me, I'm not good with computers. Just kidding. So Shodan is a search engine for internet connected devices. So what does that mean? If it's connected to the internet and it has an IPv4 address, potentially it will show up on Shodan. However, in actual practice, this is not the case. So anybody here know what FirstNet is? Yeah? OK, so there's a few of you who know what FirstNet is. FirstNet is a phone slash internet slash a whole bunch of different things provider that uh, provides communication for like first responders. So for those of you who have never responded to a emergency event, so I'm trained by FEMA and a whole bunch of other people too. Uh, if you go to an emergency event, what is the first thing that people do? They pull out their phone and they start taking pictures and they're like filming the guy who's dead on the floor and they start sending out traffic immediately, right? And when you have a mass casualty event and everybody pulls out their phone and they start doing the exact same thing, you lose the ability to send phone calls, you lose the ability to send text messages, you cannot move data. There is a ton of stuff that ends up happening. So if you've ever read about like, oh, I was present at a, I don't know, let's say a, a concert and there was a shooting and then I couldn't contact law enforcement. I tried and I tried and I tried and my phone just wouldn't connect. And we probably all heard that story, right? So if you have heard that story, what they did was they went out and they created something called FirstNet. So FirstNet allows you to make a connection to these services by, by essentially bypassing all of the normal people. So if you have a, for, a FirstNet device, you can pick up your phone and you can make that phone call and it will just essentially push all of that TikTok traffic and all of the other traffic that everybody else is trying to do. So if they're trying to like dance in front of the person who's down on the floor or whatever, you don't have to worry about that. You can get past all of that. So uh, with that said, if we took all of the IP addresses that are cut for AT&T, so Aaron, right? A-R-I-N, not Aaron, not A-A Ron, but A-R-I-N. Um, if you, I see you laughing. <laughs> If you take those IP addresses and you put them into Shodan, unless you have an agreement with Shodan, you will find nothing, okay? So you can take those IP addresses, you can dump them into Shodan, you're gonna see nothing. If we were to go and pull the IP addresses that have been given to like um, Marsoc, SOCOM, uh, the vast majority of federal IP addresses, if we take any of this stuff and we go stick that into Shodan, it's not gonna work, okay? It's gonna come back and it's gonna say nothing found, or very rarely you'll hit it just before they clear it because they use a script to get rid of this stuff. Like they occasionally scan through whatever's showing up and then they clear it all out. Every once in a while you'll grab something, like you'll find like something on port 80 or something on port 443, and then if you come back to it like in a day later, all of that stuff will be gone, okay? So for most of us, uh, you're not gonna be able to use even an upgraded, and when I say upgraded, you can pay $50. I think it's $50. Uh, but you can go and you can pay 50 bucks to the people at Shodan, and then they will upgrade your account, and then you get the access to more stuff. Uh, you can use their API keys, uh, you can look for uh, certain things using filters, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you get access to, but even that is not as valuable as the account that you can get for like the low, low cost of $2,000 a month. If you can get the $2,000 a month account, then that's when we get to talk in and you get access to some really cool stuff. How many tiers are there? Like, this app, this is all the way to like, the I think three, but don't quote me on that because I, I have sat in the room and talked to them about other stuff with a guy from Department of Homeland Security. And so you can get everything, but it's money and it's not money that I can afford. So that's how I would put that. There is a way to get everything, but I just, on a personal level, I would never be able to afford that. I can't pay two, three, four thousand. Yeah. Mm 
repeat the question. So the question was, how many tiers of access does Shodan have? And the answer is, I'm going to say three. That's what I would tell you. And the third level, the highest tier for us is like 2,000 something bucks a month. So that's, that's where I would put that. So Shodan, uh, while sort of affordable, unless depending on what you want to do, uh, is relatively easy to use. So if you've ever used a search engine, like Google, DuckDuckGo, uh, Ask Jeeves, AltaVista, any of those, right? You should, in theory, be able to use Shodan. Uh, it also supports its own keyword searching language, very similar to how like you can Google dork. So if you don't know what Google dorking is, Google dorking is the uh, method of you sitting there at the Google prompt, and then you can type in something like in URL, and then equals, and then you can put maybe .pdf, and then uh, you can put a little bit of extra text, and then by the time you boiled this thing down, you're only getting web pages that have PDFs that are related to, let's say, the national health system in Britain, and then at that point, you're dumping all of their documents potentially, right? So there's a whole bunch of really cool stuff you can do, it, do with it once you do that. So, how does Shodan itself work? Let's, we, we need to understand how this thing works before we can move into how to actually use it. So Shodan themselves, tells, they tell everybody that they are a homegrown distributed port scanner. Um, what I'm going to tell you is I believe that they use mass scan. Okay? That's, they, they have done some things to mass scan, but they are using mass scan. Uh, and we'll talk about mass scan here in a little bit. So there exists approximately 4,294,967,296 IPv4 addresses, and that pool is 32 bits in size. And scanning those addresses is what is known as an embarrassingly parallel workload and can be easily distributed over any number of systems. I actually had a lawyer help me to write this out, so I'm gonna read the whole thing. So the term embarrassingly parallel simply means that little or no effort is needed to separate this problem into a number of parallel tasks. Password cracking and 3D video rendering are also examples of this type of problem. So what does that mean? That means that all of those IP addresses with just a handful of computers and access to something like AWS or Azure, we can actually scan every single one of those IP addresses in a rapid amount of time. Uh, you can scan pretty much every IP on the IPv4 address chain in minutes if you have enough money, okay? So, yeah. Oh, and if you and if it's reachable, and, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes into that, which therefore also means that it could be even shorter, because as soon as it tries to hit, it's going to come back and it says it can't access. Did you have a question? Yeah. So, to your knowledge, is government run or is it government I so I don't want to use the word government approved. I wouldn't say that, but the gentleman who created it and and runs it. If you look at his LinkedIn, he doesn't have anything linking him back to the government. So, but he's a cool guy. I will tell you that. Like, very awesome guy, never hesitates to write back whenever I've written to him. I mean, he's, I, I like the guy. So, with that said, the next question often that comes up is, well, is Shodan illegal? Can I get in trouble for using this? So, I am not a lawyer and I am not your lawyer. So please, if you decide to go get yourself jammed up, do not tell them that I sent you to go do anything, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> I will 100%, I am going to deny it, okay? Right. So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, some of us may or may not be familiar with it, but typically what we are concerned about whenever we're dealing with computers is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. If you go to my webpage, you can actually come here, you can, Click on it, and then you can go to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. You can actually read it. Um, contrary to popular belief, most of the laws are not like secret. Uh, you can go in and you can see like this is what they tell you. Now it may not be completely legible to us, but you can actually sit there and you can read it. So we're going to go over a little bit about it. So. That act is a computer trespass statute that could potentially come into play when using Shodan or MassScan, more likely MassScan, within the United States. So widespread scanning could fall into several provisions revolving around scanning. 
intentionally access a computer without authorization or exceed authorized access and thereby obtain information from any protected computer. Doesn't that sound vague? Like when you read that, doesn't that sound super vague? I'm gonna make a personal comment here as soon as we get through these on why this stuff is so vague. So knowingly cause the transmission of a program, information, code, or command, and as a result of such conduct, intentionally cause damage without authorization to a protected computer. So if I told you delete system 32, maybe, right? Intentionally, and don't, if you're following along at home, do not delete system 32. Uh, intentionally access a protected computer without authorization and as a result of such conduct, recklessly cause damage. And intentionally access a protected computer without authorization and as a result of such conduct, cause damage and loss, right? So the CFAA functions as both a civil as well as criminal statute and violations can result in criminal prosecution, fines and prison time. Private parties harmed by violations can sue for injunctive relief. That means that they can make you do something or they can get money out of it. Okay, so injunctive relief means that they can force you to take an action. So is Shodan or Mascan a case of intentionally accessing a protected computer without authorization that could cause harm or loss? It depends on if a prosecutor is interested in causing you harm. Okay, you will not get jammed up until you step on the wrong toes and then you will get jammed up. Okay. Uh, laws like the CFAA are in place to allow for enforcement discretion or selective enforcement. Everybody, anybody ever hear of selective enforcement? Uh, oftentimes that's a very popular thing for people to be angry about regarding what? Automotive tickets, driving along in your car and some guy comes up and he says, hey, do you know why I pulled you over? And you say, no, why? And he says, because you were speeding, but I'm gonna let you go. Selective enforcement, right? They can make that decision to let you go. They don't have to enforce the exact same law over and over. But prosecutors hold wide latitude in deciding when, who, how, or even whether they should prosecute for violations of this crime. And if they decide that your scanning is an affront to someone of note, you will find yourself in court. So Shodan is probably safer than mass scan as you are moving the burden of performing the scanning from your control to someone else, okay? So typically, what we do, what we use Shodan for is, I will teach my kids how to use, and when I say kids, I mean, uh, this guy right here is one of my kids, right? So, because I'm a, I'm a teacher, but when I'm talking about kids, I'm talking about my college kids. What I do is I start them off with Mascan, and I will tell them, here, use Mascan, we're gonna scan a couple of computers, or maybe look at a network on Amazon AWS, and then from there we switch over to Shodan, because then at that point, we're not flagging logs at computers all over the world saying that we are scanning their systems. <clears throat> Aaron Schwartz, anybody know that name? No, Aaron Schwartz, he, he ran Reddit for a brief period of time, that man was in charge of Reddit, and then he got in trouble for what, downloading books? And they ended up prosecuting that kid so badly that he ended up killing himself. He took his own life, okay? So if you don't know who Aaron Schwartz is, A-A-R-O-N-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z, whenever you are done here today, uh, you should go home and you should watch The Internet's Own Boy, which is the movie about Aaron Schwartz. And that will give you a very, very good idea about what a prosecutor can do, regardless of what you did what they can do to you and your life and your family and everybody that you know in the event that they get upset about what you're doing. Uh, there's also another lesser known event that happened in Texas. There's a team of guys, they get hired to go do penetration testing by a county out in Texas. So the county says, hey, come on in. We want you to test these, test our defenses, see how secure everything is. And so they signed documentation that said that they were allowed to go in and actually uh, break into a court building. And they had all the documentation, everything all set up. And so they break into this building and the next thing they know, the sheriff shows up. Anybody here ever dealt with the sheriff out in Texas? They are literally the kings of their kingdom, literally. No one can touch these guys. They're, it's amazing. I spend a lot of time with a lot of sheriffs out there. Oh, thank you. Oh, let's see, where was I? Selective enforcement, something, something, yeah, jail. Yeah. 
the, the story of Texas. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, yes. So Aaron Schwartz. Um, so these guys, they get hired. Their job is to go out and they're going to do some penetration testing. Uh, they go into the building. They break in successfully. Sheriff shows up and they're like, hey, we've got our papers Psh, right here. We're good, right? And the sheriff, unbeknownst to them, was in a feud with the judge. And they had broken into a sheriff's building instead of the judge's building. So they immediately realized this and they're like, hey, can we see that piece of paper? And they're like, yeah, here you go. And so they ended up, long story short, arresting these guys and holding them in jail out there in Texas for about a year and a half, okay? So they did a year and a half in jail because those two decided to get in a fight. And finally, like finally, as this thing just starts to make like national news and people are getting super upset about what's going on and, you know, free these guys and they're getting ready to go out there and start like demanding justice, they realize that there may have been a mistake and they let these guys go, right? So the reason why I bring this up is, and I, and I reiterate this with my kids all the time, it doesn't matter if you're right, okay? It doesn't matter if you have the documentation and you have the signatures and you have everything else. None of those things matter. The only thing that matters is, did you make a mistake and can somebody get you on it and do they want to get you? That is the most valuable thing you can understand is who's gonna be upset at what you do. And this also goes back to why I tell my students, you're our job with Shodan and with these other tools, like people think that it's like this sexy thing to go out and we're gonna break in and we're gonna embarrass people and we're gonna put egg all over their face and then they're gonna be so enamored with us that they're gonna give us a job, right? We're gonna get picked up by the feds and we're gonna become super NSA, CIA agents because we decided to go break in and turn off electricity for all of Nevada for three months. Like that, that's not real life, that's not how it works. And when you look at what happens to the vast majority of these people, they get charged with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and then they get a writer on it, and then somebody decides to make their career by sticking it to you, because they're a prosecutor just like they did Aaron Schwartz. And, it's, and I, it's not the fact that I'm saying this to scare anybody whenever we're working through this, I'm telling you these things because we have evidence. We have the videos, we have, the the losses of life we have these guys mug shots we have everything so we don't want to get jammed up right like ultimately that is what we don't want to do and that's why when i tell you about mass scan here in a little bit uh it is very 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 important that you are very cautious about how you use mass scan because i'm going to go over some of the things that you can use for this don't go in there and start scanning every IP address for MARSOC. Like, yes, there are computers on those, at the end of those MARSOC IP addresses and they will come back, but somebody will be upset about it. Somebody will, they will not like it, okay? So with that, that's your, that's your warning, okay? So not everyone has that knowledge or resource to use MassScan, because essentially what Shodan is using is they take MassScan and then they combine it with something like Elasticsearch and then they scan all of the IP addresses on the internet and then they dump that into, mass, into Elasticsearch and then what they do is they individually will scan each one of those IP addresses that answered back and then they'll do stuff like port scanning and they'll get headers and they'll try to find out like what is at the other side of that box and then they take all that information and they provide it to you. Now there is a VIP list. I used to show this VIP list. That VIP list has disappeared off the internet and I got told that like showing the VIP list to people at meetings is probably not a good idea. So I'm gonna just gonna describe it, okay? So what the VIP list is, is it is IP addresses, networks, and companies that essentially, for whatever reason, and please don't ever emulate this, if I scan your network, sending me a message back that says, this is a Boeing subcontractor working on important stealth technology do not scan our network, we are upset about this. That is not a smart way to do business, but that VIP list, they actually kept that and they would publish it online. So you could go in and you could see all of these people who would tell you exactly what they do with that company and then tell you to cut it out. And they would, 
they would drop them off with Shodan and they would no longer be available for you to be able to take a look at their stuff, but then that you would have a little note that would show you exactly what they were doing at the other end of that IP address. So that was kind of the Wild West days. Uh, a lot of that has disappeared. They used to have like FBI guys on there. They used to have Boeing and, and you're shaking your head because I used to send this to everybody. I loved it. I would tell people like, be sure to add them to the, the VIP list, all kinds of stuff. So it's a huge mess, right? Both legally as well as technologically. So that's why we use Shodan. So what are we doing? We're doing reconnaissance. That is the purpose of Shodan. The whole purpose of Shodan is reconnaissance. And for some folks, there's like this bad taste in regards to using military terminology. Like anybody here ever heard like the kill chain? Yes. Okay, yeah, everybody throws up their hand and goes, yeah, the kill chain. Most of these people are not killing nobody, okay? But it's a, it's a figure of speech. It's to get up there and to talk about so that, so that the same level of communication that you have with some grizzled old major at an organization who, <laughs> I know, some grizzled old major at an organization who just got a message from some Asian K-pop star asking him on a date and he's got to come in and ask you, hey, do you think this is real? Uh, and you got to be like, nah, I, I don't think it's real because we don't like you and I know she doesn't like you. <laughs> you should definitely go for that. You know, uh, right. You know the latest South Korean uh, K-pop web you know, viral thing is not even a person. Oh yeah, there's the, the little AIs. It's an AI gal, mm -hmm. and, she's, and she's now one of the biggest uh, TikTok uh, virals in, in, in South Korea. I'm gonna keep it old school, Hatsune Miku, we're not going past that. That's as far as it goes. I, I only saw one laugh, so <laughs> Google it, <laughs> enjoy. enjoy. Um, so you have to have standard terminology. So reconnaissance, that's going to be part of our standard terminology here. Uh, how do you know somebody's from Texas? Don't worry, they'll tell you. How do you know somebody uses Arch? Don't worry, they'll tell you. I use Arch and also I'm from Texas. Uh, pseudo Pac-Man Switch S DNS utils. That's going to be the first thing that you're going to do. Uh, once you do that, you can run host on an IP address. Now, if you choose an IP address like I did on Dell.com, now usually I have all kinds of stuff and we sit here and we do it together because I make it a point to demonstrate what, what does Dell.com point to? Usually a load balancer, right? And then from that load balancer, you're gonna hit a whole bunch of IP addresses. So even if we were to do host Dell.com, potentially we're getting the regional IP address for the Southwest that they want you to hit but if we were located out in China right now, we'd get a completely different IP address, right? But is it like that? Is it a little bit? Okay. So um, luckily, having done this not being my first rodeo, uh, I actually have video of some of the stuff that I do. So we go in and we run host, and I think that, yeah, that's, that's starting over. Also, I use fish. Uh, host, dell.com, hit the enter. So we get our list of IP addresses, and then we also get a little bit of information about where the mail is handled, their MX records, and then we can do a who is. And then as that works through, uh, we'll get some additional information, including a CIDR. I don't like to say CIDR. I know that's the thing, but. <laughs> and so then we have this. And from there, you can take that, that net right here we can go take that to Shodan and we can dump that in. Now, at the time that this was made, we got 912 results. And some of the top services that we got, uh, with this being in the Round Rock, Austin, Texas area, we got HTTP, HTTPS, SSH, NTP, DNS. Uh, it breaks down to what operating systems it's seen, so Windows 7 or 8. Uh, it can see Windows 11. Sometimes stuff doesn't always come back as exactly the operating system that it is. It just gets interpreted as something. And then, of course, a version of Linux, and then what are the top products? Uh, IIS, what's that? Web server, right? Uh, Apache web server, HTTP API, NTPD, and then OpenSS. And then we can also find some interesting ports, like 27960. Anybody remember what that is without reading it? It's Quake. So the original Quake servers were on 27960, and guess what? They're still out there. 
we can go and we can look for 27960 and we can find Quake servers. Yeah, hit me. So the question was, what is the host command and where does it come from? Uh, so no, it, regardless of what copy of Linux you have, uh, you can still gain access to host. However, to get host as a command under Arch or Manjaro, you would use Pacman switch s DNS utils. Uh, Debian has something. I think even on Debian, if you type in host, hit enter, it'll actually pop up and it'll tell you this is the command's not available, this is how you install it, and then it'll give you some instructions. Uh, but DNS utils comes with a whole bunch of commands. So once we're in Shodan, like I said, there's a way of dorking in Shodan very similar to what you do with Google. Uh, so we have ports. We can go by postal code. So it has access to I'm not going to call it limited, but not the world's greatest geo IP database lookup for the way that this thing works. But we can go in and we can say postal code 85225, and you will get what is theoretically local systems GoDaddy. A lot, a lot of GoDaddy stuff, like a lot. Anybody here work at GoDaddy? I did one time. For, for a little while? Yeah. Do you like them? Okay. Just yeah. say no. Just say no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I really do. I dislike. I do not have a, a tremendous like for GoDaddy. Yeah. Yeah. They tried to steal my credit card, but anyways, neither here nor there. Uh, cities, Apache which is the server or service, and then city, Austin. So we can find all the Apache servers that are gonna show up under Austin. Uh, VNC, country, US, so we can go by countries as well. Now there is another one called ZoomI. Anybody here heard of ZoomI? No? That's the correct answer. That was a trick question because that's the showdown equivalent for China. And if you were familiar with, with that one, watch list instantaneously. <laughs> Right, so ZoomI is the Chinese equivalent. And what's cool about ZoomI, well, I don't know if you want to call it cool. <laughs> yeah, put me on the watch list too, right? Um, so the, the right, <laughs> just call the actic, tell them that you were talking to me. Uh, ZoomI, the problem with ZoomI or the cool thing about ZoomI is, is they do not care about the VIP list. The absolutely not. You can jump on ZoomI right now and we can go put in Marsoc IP addresses and that thing is just gonna vomit everything. They dump it all. And they have like zero respect for the US, zero respect for any kind of like checks. So what I like to do is I will look for something on Shodan and if it doesn't pop up, I'll just go to the Chinese and be like, hey, what do you guys have? And of course, <laughs> Nine times out of 10, they'll just hand it over. They just fork it over. And they don't actually charge you anything, which is also cool. But the problem is they have an advanced account, but you have to have a Weibo payment. Weibo? 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 Anime? Uh, so thank you. So the Weibo account, and you would have to pay them using that. And I, I am not kidding. I tried for a year and a half to get somebody to give me a, access to their Weibo account so that I could pay for that thing. And you would not believe that when you're like, yeah, I work for the US government <laughs> and I just need you to let me pay somebody 50 bucks, they will not do it. I could not, like for the life of me. So if anybody in here has a Weibo account and can make a $50 payment and you're not planning on traveling to China anytime late, like soon, let me know. I would love for you to like, Let's link up. I want to make a payment because <laughs> I want the advanced account so I have API access. So anyways, uh, host names. We can do that too. So we can go Google as a host name and then Nginx. So we can find all the Google servers that are running Nginx. Uh, Cisco stuff, HTTPS, uh, specific ports, title. So like you can go title of a web page, Chandler Police Department. In content, HTML, Chandler Police Department, and then I can find everything that it's finding, and then we can dump that out, right? Uh, you can see here, I did HTTPS OS Windows. 
and then it's finding 27,792 boxes running HTTPS with an OS of Windows, 15,000 and something of them in the United States and so on and so forth, Canada, Netherlands, United Kingdom. That number, 27,792, anybody believe that? That's super low, right? Yeah, that's way low. That's way low. That, the reason why I show you this is for the, I want you to see, we can put stuff in there, but that VIP list will keep us from finding a ton of stuff, like a ton of stuff. Because all somebody has to do is craft a very, very nicely worded letter and send that to the Shodan people and just be like, hey, please don't scan us anymore. We're working on top secret information. Be sure to like put it all in there, right? Uh, but if you put all the, the stuff and tell them, hey, I'm doing something, please don't scan me anymore, they will not. And then you fall off the list at some point. And every once in a while, you just got to re-up with them and let them know, hey, please take us off of your stuff and they'll continuously drop you off. So let's dump into honeypots real quick. So what is a honeypot? A honeypot is a method by which you can create a system that will look like a legitimate system and then you let somebody attack it so that you can gain information from that attacker. Uh, one of my favorite honeypots in the whole world is GasPot. Anybody use GasPot? No? So what GasPot is, is it allows you to create a honeypot that looks kind of like a gas station. So you would have like eulage and you would have the amount of fuel, uh, you would have weight, you would have temperature, you would have all this information and then you kind of push that up and then you see what do people do with it? Are they scanning it? Are they repeatedly coming back and checking it out and so on and so forth? One of the problems that we have and one of the things that I really don't like is there are gas stations that are located all over the world but most importantly here within the United States even at places like airports where they release so much information about what is available through that location. Right? So you can find out, do they have jet fuel? Do they have uh, diesel? Uh, how much do they have? And if you track it over a long enough period, then you know how much traffic they're getting, how often are people coming and filling up. There's a lot of information that you can derive from these systems uh, that a well-funded slash well red attacker could potentially use like there's certain things that i'm going to talk about in here that even sometimes you all are going to look at and be like why would we even care about that right but then if you're a bad guy and you have access to that information it can very quickly become something that can become hey this is information that's so valuable to us we can make this into like our primary number one target like we could use this to attack this place colleges that deal with nuclear material right because there are Anybody here ever work at a college that had nuclear material for like research? I, I saw a hand go up. And they have this stuff. And if you're, if you're on the internet and you are broadcasting to everybody that you have the measuring tools for a certain type of radiation and it's very, very expensive to have those tools, does that or does that not pique somebody's interest, right? Like, why would you have that? I don't have that. At my house, I'm not measuring down to the, the very smallest of particles, so probably not at my home. But if I have a location that's in a certain area and I can jump on Google Maps and I can look at that area and I see an area that's been kind of cordoned off and now it has fencing and it has raised walls and maybe those walls have been a little bit um, uh, reinforced to prevent somebody from running a vehicle through them. And we can see all of this from Google Earth now you're starting to put together, right? Like with open source tools, you can become an incredibly dangerous person uh, in terms of what knowledge you can gain just from what's publicly available, right? Now, with honeypots, one of the benefits of these honeypots is you can defeat a lot of them with just the cat command, okay? So you log in to the honeypot and then just cat Etsy password and nine times out of every single time, that Etsy password will be the same across to every single box. And so how common is that? Go ahead. So if somebody just set up an open canary box, change that Etsy slash password configuration? That's one thing, yes. You would, need to, you would need to go in and you would need to make sure that... Repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was, if I stood up a box like open canary, what are some of the changes that I would need to make in order to prevent somebody from realizing that they're in a honeypot? 
uh, they're going to do a. So let me take a step back here. If you've ever done any kind of reverse engineering, most of us are familiar with like how malware will check to see if it's inside of a virtual machine. And then if it's inside of the virtual machine, it doesn't fire off. It just check home directories. It'll LS for certain files. It will see what you have. So if you use an off the shelf um, honeypot or any kind of like canary box or any of this kind of stuff, nine times out of 10, they've already kind of mapped out what is available on that box. And they're going to look. And if you hit a certain threshold, they just, they log out and they leave every once in a while. And one of the nice things with gas pot is you can actually connect to it. And then you have a shell and you can monitor in real time as the person is typing stuff. And so you can sit there and sometimes you'll see somebody, it'll pop in and then they'll disconnect. 30 seconds later, a human user will connect because they've been flagged. And then you'll see them like LS, CD, they'll try to run a command or curl something, and then immediately they're out. And they just, they drop the connection and they're gone because they recognize it. They realize they're in a honeypot. So it's not always, not always useful. So what are we gonna use this stuff for? Why do we want this? Business intelligence is a really good one. Uh, if you have the money and you have a business and they got a lot of cash, you can get that full hookup with Shodan. And then you can do scanning. You can set your systems up to automatically monitor what is on your network. You can look for specific IP addresses. You can look for changes in an IP address range. There's a ton of really cool stuff that you can do it with it. And then me being me, one of the other things that I often tell people to do is use it to monitor your competitors. Set it up, monitor your stuff, and then monitor the other guys. What are they doing? What accounts are they setting up? Do they have systems that are coming online and offline? Do they have cloud? All of this is business intelligence that you can use to help you set yourself in a certain directory, right? Like trajectory, sorry. Um, think outside the box, that's what we do, right? As computer users, computer people, whatever, the number one thing that you can do is you can think outside the box. Uh, in addition to that, target acquisition. I use this for target acquisition. I look for vulnerable critical infrastructure. That's what I want. I want to find the systems that could potentially cause problems and we don't break into them. We report them and we tell people to fix them. Okay. Some of the systems that I have found include water, electricity. Uh, I have found manufacturing stuff, things related to manufacturing. Uh, we have found things related to uh, scary energy. We'll call it that, code words, right? Scary energy. Uh, things that people would be very upset about if they found out that it was facing the internet. So if you figure out how some of this like ICS, industrial control systems, how they function, you can start figuring out what companies are there with them. And this goes back to the Google and Google dorking side, especially for those of you who are looking at this and thinking to yourself, oh man, this is like a cool thing that I'd like to really get into. I wanna learn how to do this stuff. Uh, you may not know how an industrial control system works on a, a lathe, right? For cutting metal at some place. But if you can find something that says this is an ICS system and then it, it gives you a little bit of information, oftentimes it'll give you like a make or model, take that to Google and then type in file type full colon PDF and hit enter. And what do you think you're gonna find? The instruction manual, RTFM, right? And so now the next thing you're doing is you're spending your evening that night reading the instruction manual for some esoteric lathe that's been put out on the internet and you find out, oh yeah, there's a default username and password for this system that if they don't cha change it, then you have full access to the system. And then that's the kind of information that you can go and you can report to somebody else and you can say, hey, guy in law enforcement, here's this data. Can you guys do something about this before somebody gets chopped up in this thing, right? So there's, there's behaviors that go along with this. Um, what's that? Mm -hmm. So this is actually the, the GitHub for that mass scan exclude list. It's gone. They got rid of it. Uh, like I said, it had government agencies, FBI honeypots, military targets, 
businesses, Boeing, all kinds of people were in there. I mean, it was fantastic. And I used to just get up and just show all the letters, everything. I loved it. And of course, the question to ask is, is an exclusion list also going to double as a very important target list? Yeah, absolutely. The minute that you start creating a list of things that you can't look at or you can't do, that immediately becomes priority number one for somebody who wants to do something bad, right? Which is why I often tell people when they're setting up either like a white list or a black list, or they're trying to create something for their network, I will warn them when you start doing something like that, that's information that you need to keep secret. Like you don't want to tell people what is on that list because that's what will draw eyes and leaving that as something for people to, to potentially just stumble upon is a lot better than putting that out in the, in the wild. Uh, here we have some vulnerable infrastructure search. So this is ICS radar, ICS map. Uh, I also go through and I found some of the instruction manuals for some of these tools like BACnet, DMP3, Ethernet over IP. Ethernet over IP, uh, kind of a cool thing that you can do is essentially if you have a device and it works off of serial, because a lot of these ICS systems are all serial or parallel based, they take those machines and they stick it into a device that uh, gives it an access to the internet over ethernet. And then of course, what do they do? They don't secure it, they just stick it up on the internet and now you have a direct serial port access to a machine that's like a million pounds and runs somebody's entire business and you can't get those parts because they're only made in China now and you have like a six year waiting list, right? So these are all kinds of things that as you deal with this stuff, you gotta think about. Uh, Niagara Fox, IEC 104, Red Lion. Yeah, go ahead. Well, that seems, that's that, that centrifuge controller? Uh-huh. What? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Uh, the, the, the question was, was that a centrifuge controller that was shown up there? And the answer is yes, that is a centrifuge controller. And so there, once you start learning what the devices are, what they're called, serial numbers, ports, so on and so forth, all of this is information that you can use to identify the stuff that you're gonna run into whenever you start the scanning process. And every single item up here, I will tell you right now, is something that I have potentially ran into and that is why it is on this list. Okay, now I've been doing this talk for a long time, but there's a lot of really seriously bad stuff here, right? And some of this stuff has been on the internet. Uh, in addition to that, Elastistack, the NFL, what they did was they took all of their players, all of their injuries, everything that's wrong with them, every disease they've ever had, all the money they make, everything that they do, their homes, their addresses, the places that they like to hide when they get away from their wife, all of the information that somebody at the NFL would want to have about a football player so that they could go in and find this guy, uh, they put that into an Elastistack server with no password and then left that Elastistack server up on the internet. So we had access to names, social security numbers, like I said, what doctors they see, who has uh, issues with their, their body parts, all kinds of stuff. And the betting sites just love that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? The, the comment was, the betting sites probably love that. Yeah, could you, when you think about if your product is a person, the information about that person, what drugs are they on? What narcotics are they potentially using? Could it look like they are abusing painkillers? All of that information is something that you could potentially use to go and manipulate somebody to, uh, if you decided, let's just say that you wanted to affect a game and you find out that their player star player or something like that is potentially addicted to something, is that something that you could go out and offer that guy at a nightclub, run into him? People do less with, a, with less. People do less and people do more with less information than if, you, if I had all the data on you. So all of this stuff is potentially um, very dangerous. Uh, and then of course, Exactus, they were breached. Their Elastistack search. Uh, what I like to do is under Shodan, you can go in and you can type in looking for Elastistack servers, and then I will ignore anything under 10 gigabytes. 
just if it's under 10 gigabytes, it's not worth my time. Anything above 10 gigabytes, there is a tool that you can go on GitHub and you can pull down for uh, checking Elastistack servers. So you can use the API under Shodan, pull down all the Elastistack servers. It's all in JSON. You pull the IP addresses and then you dump it into that system. And then it'll give you the names of all of the Elastistack um, uh, indices. indices. Yes, thank you. Uh, and so if you have all of the indice names, then you can look for something juicy, right? Medical terms. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you might want to peek around for, because some of it's logs, like it is. Sometimes it's just somebody's Nginx or Apache or whatever, and they're just pumping logs into that thing all day. Uh, but sometimes uh, you get really lucky, like some folks did, and you find all of the data about all of the citizens in a South American country where you get everything, including all of their health records and all of their financial records and all their credit cards and everything that the government has on them. Uh, you get all of that in one neat little package and that was found in where? Florida. So if, you, if you're gonna mess with Elastistack, please secure your Elastistack server. That's gonna be my, my ask. That's my call to action in the middle of this thing. If you're gonna use Elastistack, please secure your Elastistack server. Uh, and here you go, here's a mass scan that would allow you to look for Elastistack servers. And so you can go in here and I even give you an exclude so that you don't search those. And there's tons of things that you can play with right here. So if you wanted to be able to do that using mass scan, that's kind of your, your jumping off point right there. So, okay, we've talked about all this crazy stuff, right? But does it do practical things? Yeah, sure. So. As of the point where I made this, there were 9,248,986 potentially vulnerable NTP servers on Earth, right? And what they did was Shodan actually changed it to where if you use NTP as a search, it typically doesn't show anything anymore, uh, but it's not true. <laughs> use mass scan and you'll find the NTP servers that have not been secured. And what you can do is you can take those NTP servers and you can do what's called a amplification attack. And so you can send a request to these NTP servers and the request packet will have the IP address of your target. And then when you send that out to all of the NTP servers, all those NTP servers will reply to that IP address and you can essentially crash that box uh, with very, very little effort, very minimal effort. You can just bring it down. Uh, you will often see this done by people who are selling DDoS as a service so what they do is they go out and they find all the NTP servers and then, is this too extreme? Are we, are we going too deep into the, <laughs> this, is, this, this is good? Is good stuff. Okay, so. It's good stuff, it's just like, don't do it. Yeah, don't do it, obviously, but this is what the bad guys yeah. do. Yeah, this is what happens. Um, I feel like this is no different than a bunch of people sitting around and watching like videos of graphically violent events, right? Like you're not gonna go do it, but you're watching it and you gotta learn from it, right? So uh, what they will do at the DDoS for a service places will be, they will use mass scan, they will find the systems, they will create a list and then you pay them money and then put in an IP address and hit attack and they send out the NTP packets and then they attack somebody's Xbox or whatever, which is really the IP address for their router, but they get so much traffic that it slows their system down and then they get booted a booter, right? They get booted off of Xbox Live or PlayStation Network or whatever. Uh, and that's how they do that. And they save money, quote unquote. And the reason why they're saving money is they're not going out and standing up 100 Amazon EC2 instances and paying, you know, X amount of money for all these gigabit lines so they can go knock somebody else off a line. What they're looking for is things like proxy servers that have been improperly configured. They're looking for NTP servers. They're looking for these boxes that can do this amplification attack. And the DNS is another really popular one. Uh, and then they just send the requests and see what happens, right? Uh, so that's my GitHub Retro64 XYZ and that NTP DOS, uh, that's a fork of a DDoS for using NTP. So A, don't do it, but B, if you wanna learn how it's done, you can do it off of my GitHub. That's funny, because they, um, 
I want to tell, I'll tell this story later after I'm unmiked. <laughs> they, they, they taught a class about me, and I, I want to tell you all about it, but I, I talked about, yeah, he, he knows because he's also, I'll tell you guys about it later. Um, I will tell you the truth. What I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to interrupt our regular scheduled broadcast right here real quick just to tell you. I will always tell you the truth. What's that? Are they not hearing us on the They're hearing us. Okay. That's funny. Uh, I will tell you the truth. I will tell you like it is. I will tell you the real stuff. And I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to lie to you or make things up or try to convince you all that the world is a completely different place. But with the respect that I show to the community in terms of I am going to tell you the real stuff and show you everything and actually take you on a journey, the expectation on my end is A, don't use this to attack people. Like, leave us alone. You can learn and you can do all of these things, but I don't want you to be a bad guy. And that's the respect that I expect from everybody else is don't hurt people, help people, right? That's what we're here for and that's what we're in this business for is to secure networks, to take care of people, to keep them safe. So off my high horse, right? Um, let's go over some answers. And then what I usually do is what's called the child porn speed run. Uh, which is I take you to a web page and I show you how quickly and easily it is to find people who are sharing illegal material and then build a profile on those people using these tools. We'll just talk through it because I don't have everything that I need to be able to do it on somebody else's computer, but we'll talk about this here in a second. So just to very quickly go over some of the answers. So Shodan is a search engine for internet connected devices. It provides information such as ports, banners, and is an excellent source of intelligence on the current state of the internet. Even with the reduced access that you have, it is still valuable. I will tell you that now. A simple search for open ports. Devices or program names can be dug conducted directly from the Shodan webpage in a manner similar to how Google, DuckDuckGo, or other search engines function. You can build your own version of Shodan using tools like MassScan in combination with Elasticsearch. I showed you all the MassScan search that you can use. You can take that, you can edit it, you can make a few changes to that, and you can look for all kinds of things with that. I don't, don't ever do it from your house. Real, for reals, they will cancel your internet at your home. Uh, I'm not kidding. That's not, that's not joking. If you get enough complaints to your internet service provider about your behavior, they will potentially shut your stuff down. Always use an authorized cloud provider and let them deal with it. I like Scaleways because it's in France and France doesn't have a uh, treaty. So you can do almost anything up in France and they will not report anything. Uh, it is... I'm telling you, Scaleways is super cool. <laughs> they legitimately don't care what you're doing with their network. Um, they care on paper, like they tell you, hey, don't do that, but I've never had a single complaint from them. That's the one. What's that? That's the one. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So vocabulary, is Shodan OSINT or SIGINT? Do we care? It's OSINT. Yeah, so OSINT is open source intelligence. It's the gathering of data from open source or readily and freely available sources. And signals intelligence is the act of gathering information in transit by interception. We're not, trans we're not intercepting anything. The reason why I include this is, again, a lot of these talks, I do it with like military, law enforcement, so on and so forth. So when I have these talks, I have to go over, well, is it OSINT or is it SIGINT? Who do we hand this to, et cetera, et cetera. It's OSINT. Um, it's an excellent tool. It really is. It's fantastic. I love the guy who works at Shodan, that guy who owns it. I'm connected with him on LinkedIn. Fantastic dude, always helpful. Uh, Shodan as a product is great. Yes, it requires a little bit of work. Yes, you gotta learn how to use it. Uh, I'm doing a video that I'm creating right now on my YouTube where I'm gonna teach how to use Shodan from the API. So it'll all just be off of Python. So follow me on YouTube if you want to be cool. Um, I would appreciate that because I'm trying to get to 500 subscribers. And it's a beneficial tool. It allows you to conduct deep and telling reconnaissance of targets all while never firing off a packet yourself. And that's more valuable than anything else. The less noise that you can make out in the ocean, the better. Be as quiet as you possibly can until you can't be anymore. 
Uh, but it's not foolproof, right? It does have an audit log. They do monitor what you're looking for. I guarantee you I'm on a watch list with them because the guy knew who I was when I was talking to him because I have put a lot of IP addresses into that thing that have come back as not existent and I know they exist. So undoubtedly they audit all of that stuff for later and they are monitoring what you're doing. So keep that in mind. Nothing that you put into a tool online should be considered either sacred or secret because somebody can potentially get access to that information, right? Um, so this is, I know what you download, ignore the Russian flag in the corner. Uh, what I know what you download is, is a web page that you can go to, you can put an IP address into it, and then if it has information about that IP address, it will tell you. So this uh, 160.145.18.111, that is the US Department of Defense. Okay, so that's a US DOD network right there. And <laughs> so every single one of the IP addresses that exist on the planet, you can go in here and you can dump in here. The reason why I bring this up, the four, four years ago, I want to say, maybe four, um, what ended up happening was I was going through and I was taking the IP addresses that I was finding for open systems on Shodan, and then I cross-referenced them to I know what you download. And of course, what I find is, is a US DOD network system that's all trussed up with all of the warnings up here, but one of the things that you, A, don't want to see is a big red box that says, shares child pornography, okay? And so I found that, and I was like, oh, that's not good. And so you can click, and it will show you what they're downloading. Now, you cannot get the files, but it will tell you what they are downloading. And immediately, I had an ultra huge issue with this guy because not only was he sharing illegal content but he was also sharing paw patrol and so now i'm extra upset with this person because my assumption is is if you're a child pornographer and in addition to that you also have paw patrol anybody here know what everybody know what paw patrol is right paw patrol is like a children's television show about like dogs and the dogs can talk and they get like magic powers uh Anyways, so he has Paw Patrol and he has the CP. And so now I'm like, I, this guy is, has to go. Like immediately we're gonna find this guy and we're not stopping. So I took the IP address and then I dumped that into who is. And when you dump an IP address into who is, it drops out and it'll actually tell you, contact these individuals if you have an issue with them. Don't, because it could potentially be the person on that list. You go to law enforcement, okay? So what I did was I went to the ACTIC and I said, hey, Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center, here's an IP address, this is the child pornography that they're downloading, here's the names of the videos and here are the hashes. And then in addition to that, I am super pissed off right now because the guy also has Paw Patrol. So my assumption is, is that he has access to children. This guy has to go and he has to go now. And I kid you not, within about an hour and a half, I got a very, very, very angry phone call from a lady who was very short with me from Washington. And so she calls me up and says, I have received your phone number and I have blah, blah, blah information sitting on my desk right now. What is this? And I said, hey, I'm on, I know what you download. It's a Russian web page that it, they collect information about US computers all over the place. They, co they collect all of that data and then they make it publicly available. And I was like, but you understand the implications there, right? And she was like, yeah, I do. If you don't understand the implications, the implications is, is they're gathering information about everything that we do here within the United States on our system. And so they know who has kitty porn. They know who's looking at things from IP addresses that they should not be. They have access to the list of all the US Department of Defense networks, right? Because you can take that Aaron list and then you can take that and you can just compare it. It's not secret, it's just time, right? They took the time to put this all together. We have enough brain power in this room, we could build this right now. And we could probably get it done in a day or two, okay? But the fact of the matter is, is they built this and they made it publicly available. So I explained everything to her and her reply was, I will handle this. And she slammed that phone down. And I, I don't know, a couple of days later, I get phone calls from several different people who are like, hey, who'd you pissed off? Like there's all kinds of stuff going on right now. And I was like, well, I'm, I, and I tell people the story, they will take care of it. It's not okay. You're gonna find all kinds of things and those people have got to go.
Like, there's no argument, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm being very polite about this, but they have to go. And so, if you find something, you can report that to your local law enforcement, and if you have problems with that, you can send it to, here within the state of Arizona, you have access to the AZ Actic, and they will take care of these things. So, yeah. Um, so, how does child pornography fall into terrorism? Honestly, if we really wanted to get kind of semantic with this, sales, raising money, it, it, there's all kinds of things that go on within the, the illicit goods market, yeah, the black market, however you want to call this. There are behaviors that people partake in that if they can't get them readily, they will buy them from folks who want to raise money. And if you're a desperate organization and you're looking to make cash, that's just one more method by which they can do that. Uh, and when you look, historically speaking, at some of the terrorist organizations, and then you think about some of the things that we've dealt with as you know, the US military with like the Bachi Bazi kids. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The little boys that they dress up as girls overseas. Yeah, uh, yeah see, as soon as I say it that way, everybody remembers what I'm talking about. Because we had that guy who got in trouble, the special forces guy or whatever, he went over there and he just beat the crap out of those dudes. And they ended up pulling him out of the, the thing and tried to discharge him and all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff happens over the world is what I'm telling you. And there's a ton of bad things. And even from here, we just essentially show Dan and I know what you download. You can immediately start the process of locating these people. And I'm, I'm not kidding. When I said speed run, it wasn't a joke. One of the things that we typically do, because it, there's a community called speedrunners. They play video games really fast. That's the, that's the fastest way to put this. They get on the internet, they play video games, they do it super fast, and they film it, and then they have like world records and stuff. Do you run into uh, the situations with fentanyl and those kind of things? Finding this stuff on there? Those are, I mean, these cartels and everything, and stuff, they're being supported, of course, by the Chinese, the Russians, whatever, and behind the scenes, I suppose. I don't know, but you run into those kind of things that happen now? So the question was, essentially, do we ever run into other like dark markets, black markets, drugs, fentanyl, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so I have an entire two hour talk called Introduction to Dark Markets, where I teach um, usually like parents and law enforcement. I'm, I'm doing a talk here soon for um, parents of foster kids, where we talk about things like drugs. Okay. And here I tell you essentially, and a lot of these markets have closed down, so you won't be able to follow my footsteps, but I could always rebuild this if necessary. Uh, I talk about narcotics, where to buy killers for hire, uh, how to get identification, where to go buy prostitutes, uh, underage and above age. You know, there's, there's different places that you can go to online where you can make these kinds of purchases and you can go through this entire process and you can get yourself some fentanyl and you can get uh, a 15 year old boy and you can have all of this stuff essentially sent to your hotel room somewhere in some of these nations because of the way that the internet works and things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and, and anonymization and uh, just the, the gamut of all of the things that are available to people today, it is too easy to gain access to these things. And they absolutely do. And we have partnerships like, um, and I hate to say it this way, but everybody kind of knows the joke of anybody going to Vietnam or you know Cambodia, they, what were they, Thailand, what were they doing? Like if you, if you told somebody, I, I think um, they even made a comedy skit where they showed people learning languages and they have like the lady, she's like, I'm learning Japanese because I'm gonna become a cook. And somebody else says, oh, I'm learning Spanish to go to Mexico and, and I'm gonna sit on the beach. And then some guy's like, I'm going to Thailand for reasons. Yeah. And he like shadily looks away, right? <laughs> it's such a well-known thing amongst so many communities that they make jokes about it on like SNL or whatever this came from. Um, so what I say to that is, yes, absolutely those things exist. Yes, absolutely people are gaining access to these things. Drugs, 
they order them all the time online. The stuff goes in and out of the Phoenix area constantly. Uh, I have, I am not envious in the least of the individuals who work in the postal service with the amount of work that they have to go through fighting this stuff because the postal service is incredibly abused by individuals who use these dark markets. I'm out of time. Okay. Yeah, well, eight, okay. So with that said, thank you everybody. I appreciate you all letting me talk. Uh, oh, thank you. I could have let him go all night, but you know, we've got more stuff to get. Yeah. To. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so with that said, thank you. And if you all have any questions or need a business card or, or want to talk to me or anything like that, uh, just let me know. Happy to do it. Thank you.